Well, good evening. Here we are at the uh, end of uh, October. This is October 31st, 2023. And uh, I have just uh, enjoyed uh, the whole experience of getting through this wonderful, short, but important chapter 12 of the book of Zechariah. And I hope that you have been as blessed as I've been because we took time to do this. Hey, look, we did get several of you who asked us to do a short exposition concerning the Battle of Armageddon. And we're going to uh, do that starting the month of November. It's going to be short now. I mean, I'll be the the whole session uh, or the Bible study, maybe five to ten minutes. But we're going to say just a little bit about uh, the Battle of Armageddon as we know it. And as others have done some some good work on the topic. But tonight, so that we can continue to maximize our time and keep ourselves in the word of God itself. I believe we've dedicated a lot of time to some other peripheral things. So uh, this exposition word by word, line by line is, is kind of important. So open your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 12. We'll be looking starting at verse 10. We'll give a short review of verse 9. And then we'll just keep going, trying to get through the text. And y'all know this is difficult for me, right? Y'all know this is difficult for me, but we're going to make it. All right, let's bow our heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask now that you would open our hearts and our ears again so that we can hear truth and proceed those things that you are urging us to do. Thank you for last week's lessons from the life of David, and thank you for showing us that when you are with us, that you own uh, the vengeance of our enemies and adversaries. We ask that you would keep our hearts humble. We, we, may we not be, get lifted up in pride because you do defend and protect those who are yours. So help us now to honor you with this. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Flowers fade, grass withers, but the word of our God endures forever. So let's see, the next 17, 18 minutes, what can we say about Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10? Well, again, chapter 12, verse 9 talked about the expression, seek to do. Uh, I listened with you uh, last week during the Bible study, and that last line of uh, our discussion really got me, and I want to start tonight by reading this. This is exactly what, when it says uh, in verse 9 that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, his was, his was the commentary. The expression seek to do is always used in the Bible for seeking to do what it is a person's set purpose to do if he can. If I can do it, my purpose, this is my purpose if I can do it. Now remember our context is God and him being the defender of Judah's tents in Jerusalem, right? And him being uh, declaring that he's going to defeat all of her enemies. God said he would destroy. So once again, it has to do what is in a purpose, set purpose to do if he can. We agreed last week and we started this week by saying we serve a God who can. Now we're not going to try to make the scripture say something is not. But I believe we can use the principle. Remember these are promises to Judah and Jerusalem, God's people, ancient people rather. But we are God's people today. So in a comparative sense, God loves us no less than he loved them. God cares for us today no less than he cared for Israel back then and now. And if we have trusted him to be Lord and Savior, then we've trusted him to be our deliverer. It's part of our salvation, right? That, that who comes to him, he's able to keep 
until the end. He will lose none. All right. It also says that man may seek to do a thing and fail, but woe indeed to those whom Almighty God shall seek to destroy. For that on which God's heart is once set, God will surely accomplish, whether it be in blessing on his people or in revenge on his enemies. That's where we stopped last week. And that, uh, that truth of that paragraph really linger with me for an entire week. Why? How do y'all look? I don't have a whole lot of people in my life right now who I know as an enemy, but I do have some stuff <laughs> that I can put in the category as against me. Got it? I don't have a whole lot of people. I don't, I don't have a whole lot of flesh and blood, people that are calling me, threatening me, uh, stepping up to me, uh, uh, rolling up on my car. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Calling my phone, harassing me. I don't have, thank God, I don't have a lot of that going on in my life. Matter of fact, as I speak in this moment, none of that. But I do have some enemies of my soul. Got it? And they are vigilant. Now, I bump into them every day. Sometime every minute of the day, I am addressing those enemies of my soul. Those things that come to take my peace, my joy, my serenity, take my hope to uh, destroy my faith, my trust, my contentment. I, all, I, I have some things that are against me, right? And so, I try to take truths like here that we got at the end of verse nine to literally apply in my life so that I could be encouraged and know that God would take care of whatever's against me and is predicated back up there to verse eight. If I am moral and if I am indeed tuned in to God is deserving of my worship and him alone. Okay. Verse 10, Zechariah chapter 12. And if we would read through chapter 13, verse 1, what does it mean? Well, in John's gospel, um, especially verse 10 of the 19th chapter of John, John applies the smitten Christ. And these verses contrast what is known as Israel's treatment of the Messiah at his first advent, when he was rejected and slain, and their treatment of him at his second advent, when he, be, he will be received and exalted. So that's the, uh, that's the contrast we have. And it's almost like uh, the line of demarcation between Zechariah's two oracles, first burden that of rejecting Christ, the ninth chapter through the eleventh chapter of Zechariah, and then the acceptance of Messiah, chapter uh, 12 through chapter 14. All right? And the first one, he is rejected and slain, and the second one, he is received and he is exalted. Open your Bibles and look at verse 10. And remember, we said this is where we may take a little time to really tarry on verse 10 because it's such a key verse of the chapter and I want to make sure we give proper room and space to examining it. Let me make sure that I have my notes right because I don't want to miss anything because this is a very important part of our study. All right, it reads, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his own son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Let's read the word of God one more time. And I will pour upon the house of David 
and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Wow, poor. They shall look upon me with whom they have pierced, it's crucifixion, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his own son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his own firstborn. I will pour. Let's get this. I will pour. So there are several key uh, phrases here. First one, I will pour. The second one, the spirit of grace and supplication, if you have your Bible open. And then thirdly, look upon me whom they have pierced. Let's look first of all at I will pour. God is speaking here. It is God in his own perfect time and by his own power will sovereignly act to save Israel. And this was prophesied by other prophets. This same prophecy of saving God's people has been proclaimed by Ezekiel and Sister Modric Rodney, my girl who always need the address, Read, if you would, dear heart, Ezekiel chapter 39 and start at about verse 20 and read through verse 29. Okay. And then in the book of Joel, G-O-L-E, the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And many of us know that wonderful passage in the last day that I will pour out my spirit, said the Lord. And then a New Testament passage that comes to us from the Apostle Paul, and that will be found in the book of Romans, chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. Romans 11, verses 25 through 27. Excuse me. All right. So that's what God means when he says, I will pour. We know Joel's prophecy very well. In the last day, said the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. You know, talk about the old men uh, having dreams, young men having visions, etc. On your maid, even upon your handmaiden, said the Lord, will I pour out my spirit. So God is going to do some pouring. Mm. But what he's pouring is what's, uh, is what's interesting to me. It's not that he's pouring. <laughs> I can pour out this water on this table and all these notes. I can take this Diet Coke and I can pour it all on the, the paper, the table, the chairs. I just poured it. So one of them would just make it wet. Another one would make it probably wet and sticky. Uh, got it? So I'm just trying to say, it matters what's being poured on you. God help me. Woo! Hey, y'all. You got to be careful in the 21st century. Not just what, but who you let pour on you. Let's, let's, let's get to the text so I don't get, I don't get sidetracked. That's, that's good stuff. I, I, but, but the phrase... I will pour, God says, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. Spirit of grace and supplication. What is this talking about? Well, without saying, the Holy Spirit is so identified because the Holy Spirit, mm, for the believer's life, it is the Holy Spirit who brings saving grace. And because that grace produces sorrow that will result in repentance, one begins to pray to God for forgiveness of sin. Remember we stated earlier, was it last week, we said our God is going to, God is going to draw uh, Israel to him. I think the phrase was, and he's going to clean her up. <laughs> Got it? Remember we were in that conversation about never said Israel was Perfect, never said Israel right. 
never said Israel was without sin, but it's just that God chose Israel. But it didn't mean she was any better than anybody else. And she had to be clean up just like anybody else. Well, this is the phrase where God says, this is how I'm going to clean her up. I'm going to pour on her grace. Grace because grace produces sorrow. I said that wrong. I like the commentary, but let me say it like this. Grace should produce sorrow in the life of any sinner and cause the sinner to have a repentant prayer unto God in a way of asking for the remission or the forgiveness of one's sin. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, unfortunately, um, I have too much practice with this grace thing. Sometimes, I, I, don't, don't worry about me being a preacher right now, just let me be a Christian. Sometimes, this Christian is almost embarrassed to get in God's presence to ask him for some more grace, to ask him and beg him for some more forgiveness. Ah, I've had too many, too many instances, too many moments of what I call grace abuse. I, I mean, for, let's, let's, just, let's just talk for a minute, Tavern friends. Things I used to do, I don't do no more. Places I used to go, I don't go no more. The way I used to think, feel, act, don't do it no more. Now, some of those things is, I'm like the old people in the church, you're real honest. Things I used to do, I can't do no more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Places I used to go, I can't go there anymore. Not that I wouldn't do them, but probably if I could get there, I probably would, but I can't. So you follow what I'm saying? There are some things in the believer's life where the point of God's grace, the uh, availability of God's grace should be producing in us sorrow that leads us to have penitent prayers to God for forgiveness. <sighs> I ask myself every time I get to a place like this in an Old Testament study, we talked about a book of prophecy, but here this book of prophecy is providing for us such New Testament, such 21st century, such right now actualities for believers in general. Forget about Israel 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago. What about us now in the last 25 minutes? Is there anybody besides me that God has just been pouring grace and supplication on? Grace to produce sorrow that should be resulting in penitent prayers. I'll look over here. Grace to, pro to produce sorrow so that I should be giving God penitent prayers. I will pour, pour what? Spirit of grace and supplication. And then finally, before we leave, the third phrase in chapter 10 is, so they look upon me whom they have pierced. Look upon me whom they have pierced. In this phrase, Israel's repentance will come before they look to Jesus. The one whom they rejected and crucified. Now this is uh, noted for us in the book of Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 and the gospel of John chapter 9 verse 37. Now, in fact, at the second advent that Romans chapter 12, excuse me, Romans chapter 11 verses 25 and 27 talk about. It is when God says, they pierce me. He's certainly affirming God is the incarnation of deity, Jesus. Mm, that's, that's why I shot right there. Jesus was God. 
says John 10, verse 30. They looked upon me, whom they pierced, whom they crucified. What I'm trying to say, in conclusion, this would be the same effect, that's E-F-F-E-C-T. It would be the same effect to the Jews as it was to Saul of Tarsha when he met Jesus on the Damascus Road, whose experience and history are in many ways of a foreshadowing of the history of his people in relationship to Christ. Paul thought he knew what he was doing. When he met Jesus on the Damascus Road, Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Looking on and piercing. Thought he was doing the church a favor. Imprisoning, causing some Christians to be destroyed. Piercing. Why are you mm, persecuting me, Paul? Who art thou, Lord, that I'm persecuting? I'm Jesus. Paul got it together, and hopefully some of us going to get it together. And in the end, what this prophetic book is talking about, some of those who are still left in Israel when Jesus comes back again, they're going to get it together too, and they're going to be all right. All right. So as I leave you tonight, it's early. Be careful. This is, uh, in, in so many means, not a, not a night of celebration for believers. We don't celebrate the trigger tree and the, the ghosts, the goblins and spells and witches and so on and so forth. But we pray that the Spirit of God will be able to prevail through all of the imagery and the seductions of darkness. And I ask you tonight, keep your children, your family safe, and you yourselves. Take a time to remind you that, mind yourself rather, that you are the light of the world and you are the salt of the earth. And that God didn't save you and leave you in this world so you can get on the bush and hide, but on a candlestick so you can give light to everybody who's in the house with you. And salt that has lost its saltiness is good for nothing than to be thrown out and trodden under the feet of men. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord let his countenance be all around you and you experience his peace until next week, which God willing will be a brand new month. Good evening, good night, and shalom.